Hey, I'm Matt Waldman with the Rookie Scouting Portfolio and Football Guys. And this morning, Sigmund Bloom and I actually did a hangout that, uh, in my uh, lack of experience with Google Hangouts, I forgot to record. But it was a really excellent conversation that we had while we watched the film of Wisconsin running back Melvin Gordon and and uh, Alabama wide receiver Amani, um, Amari Cooper. And I, I really thought that it would be fun to just kind of share some of the insights that we both had while I watched the tape. And I'm going to be inviting various writers to watch games with me. And it, it was just too much fun to just kind of let it go without having some sort of um, recording for posterity here, even though Bloom can't make it for the for, for actually me recording it this time around. I'm going to share some of his thoughts as I watch this film. And I thought it would be a chance to share it with you, some of the things that we look for and why. And um, I'll do this with various writers, probably on Fridays or, or at least as when possible during the season. And I'll post these on Google as well as on my blog. Um, the first guy that, we're gonna, that I'm going to profile today is Melvin Gordon. He's the running back out of Wisconsin. He's often considered as one of the top three running backs um, in this draft class, um, a speedster behind um, Wisconsin's excellent um, offensive line. Um, oftentimes, Wisconsin backs are kind of regarded as a little bit overrated for the fact that they are um, running behind such a good offensive line. Um, I'm just going to watch the film, we'll, and I'll point out things and kind of re rewind and you know rewind the clips and show you information that I saw and I'll point out what Blue, Bloom saw as well and contributed to the conversation um, which was really an excellent one. It's a shame that I wasn't able to finish recording it um, but we're going to start off with him and go from here. So here we go. This is against LSU who's really a good litmus test for a lot of players because LSU has such good athletes and you know this is a nice play to to actually watch in one sense because you're watching him get downhill. Um, as he gets into this hole here, you're going to see him emerge and finish with his pads fairly low, you know, bounce off of the hit a little bit, and then finish where that he's at least when he hits somebody head on, he's um, able to fall forward. Even if he doesn't get any yards due to that head on hit, the position of his pads is what's most important here. Now this is a really nice run when you're talking about his burst and I want to show you again why that is. One thing that Bloom pointed out is that it's very effortless in the way that he moves outside on this play um, and he's also not taking it to the corner store as I've talked about in the past because you're going to see where the defense is positioned at the edge here that Gordon is bouncing it outside based on what he reads and that there's no real choice for him to get inside um, on this play because at this stage right here I mean he might have been able to work inside but he's got the speed to take it out here and you look at where these two defensive backs are and where he's located he has the burst to defeat this angle that's NFL caliber burst right there even to be able to make the play outside So that's one of the defining strengths of Gordon's game is that, that short area quickness and burst. Now one of the things that I'm going to note is that Chris Spielman on the broadcast during this game talked about how Todd McShay compared Melvin Gordon to Jamal Charles. And Spielman disagreed a little bit and compared him to DeMarco Murray. And I, I'm a real big fan of um, Chris Spielman's work as a broadcaster and analyst and I can see the way that he compares McFadden is due to the body type that Gordon has. Um, he's kind of not as strong in the upper body but thick lower body, not a real big guy but you know I would say an average an average size running back. He's listed at what 6'1", 205, somewhere in the 205, 210 range is probably where he's going to end up and if he adds a little more weight to his upper body he might get above 210 and may have that DeMarco Murray type of strength but right now he doesn't have that type of tackle breaking ability. In this game he actually only breaks three tackles I watched him against OSU, against Ohio State, and he didn't break a single tackle in that game, at least a discernible one, a discernible tackle that I would count as one. But you watch this, he's, he does have functional power, 
and and that functional power does help him be able to uh, you know fall forward and lean forward with what he's doing we're gonna see a little bit of Gordon in pass protection here he's not a great pass protector at this point but as Bloom points out he is willing to hit and engage and that's an important facet of being able to pass protect if you have a running back willing to do that then you can work with him on technique and he can get better at that it just may mean that initially as a NFL prospect it might take him a season or two to really refine that and it means that he'll, he may see limited time in a starting rotation if he's not able to um, display the type of technique that he needs to to control a defender off the edge or coming up the middle. Right now he tends to load up and hit rather than punch and get great position. You know you see this run here he drags a player it's not so much Gordon breaking a tackle as much as getting through a smaller crease, getting his pads low, his head down, and you know, just kind of banging through a tight crease and then falling forward when wrapped. So not great power, just functional, but that's good enough for the NFL if you have good speed and footwork, which we're going to see a little bit more of him later. This is going to be an incomplete pass where he just throws out of bounds. Now, I believe this is an example. I think it's going to be one where he goes to the outside, where he's hemmed in inside, and he has to has to bounce it, and he shows good burst and good footwork. Again, he breaks an ankle tackle here, but again, is this really something that you're going to count as as a as a true broken tackle, a true sense of power? Not really. It's more balance when it comes to this trailing defender on the backside, you know, biting at his ankles. And he's even forced out of bounds. If he was going to turn a corner, that tackle impeded him from doing so. Again, falling forward, leaning through, getting extra yards. Nothing wrong with that. It's just not a great display of power. I mean, right here, this is a really good play to highlight where Gordon doesn't have that great power. Now he's, you know, the swivel of the hips to turn and turn outside, he's going to actually turn into hit, and it's a really a textbook hit and wrap by this um, cornerback here who's going to hit him above the knee and drive him off balance. Now, top prospects like DeMarco Murray oftentimes are able to, to at least break some of this hit with his strength, or even Ryan Matthews in college was able to bounce off some of these types of hits. And that shows you the type of upside, the rare upside that some of these players have if they're able to really harness it with hard work, knowledge of the game, discipline, that you know Murray's been hurt oftentimes, so it, you see flashes of it. With Matthews, you see flashes of it, but his work ethic wasn't always great to start with. And so, you know, you see it sometimes, but it's not always there. With Gordon, you see him getting hit and driven back on this type of a play. Again, you know, he gets head on here, hit head on, and it's, um, you know, it's a good fall forward, but again, he's not bouncing off of this guy and driving through him as much as, as much as you might see from a more powerful player. Still though, nothing wrong with it. Just not top end work as a as if you were to describe him as an all around feature back with power. This is going to be a good play to highlight here. I think no not this one, it might be one next. This is him in the passing game. Not quite comfortable with tracking the ball and where it's going to be. Part of that's on the quarterback. Okay, now watch. You're going to watch Gordon below here, and he's going to come into the inside to, to block. And watch him load up with his shoulder and elbow. He's not really facing down the man and using his hands to punch, where he can control and properly shield the defender. Um, so that the defender isn't going to get a good angle on the quarterback here. Now, while the court, defend, he gets the job done on the defender, again, if you're projecting for the NFL, this is a nice little chip, and it's, and it's certainly aggressive and physical, and you like that. That says you've got something to work with with a, defense, with a running back in, in the pass protection area. But at the same time, 
it's not refined and a defender in the NFL oftentimes is going to be able to anticipate some of this and control a man who comes with his head down and lowers his shoulder he's going to be able to kind of just you know basically break through that and make short work of a, of a running back trying to do this but again you know in the with running backs they don't have to be perfect in order to be a decent starter in the NFL here, you know, again, short area quickness, is it great? Does Matt Forte on this type of a jet sweep, is he able to make a man miss like this in this situation? Oftentimes, yes. Gordon can sometimes, too. On this particular play, the angle is too good. But, again, the footwork is good, but not great here. Now this is going to be a touchdown. It's a huge hole that he gets through, but look how he finishes. Very aggressive finish. You got to like that. I mean, look at the width of this hole. This hole here is probably the the width of like three or four Gordons as he starts to go through it. I mean, that's a that's not an NFL size hole. And if you get that in the NFL, you better make hay on this. And he does so on this play, so that's that's good. He does what's expected. But in the NFL. An NFL size hole, if you're going to project a runner, is really going to be really you're going to see a defender or a blocker here, and then one on the other side, really like shoulder width, might be a defend, uh, an NFL sized hole. And we're going to see evidence of this later, where Gordon makes a terrific play. Um, but on this, on this, you know, you're, this isn't an indication of great vision. It's just more of his athleticism and going where the play's designed. Now this is a, a fun highlight play. Nice little reversal of field, and he gets positive yards. You know, close to eight yards on this play. And we're going to watch this again because there's a number of elements of this play that are that were worthwhile that Bloom and I talked about. First, one of the things that I highlighted is the function of this play. You're looking at a two tight end set um, with a wing back who's actually the fullback but he's on the wing on this side and he's going to wind back to this side to block the basically the edge pursuit to seal the outside as these blockers work inside to slant inside and take the defensive tackle and the defensive end inside and then also you're going to see the guards kind of leak up field to block the linebackers and this is going to allow them to get some first and second level blocks to clear a hole off of this left side for Gordon to run. Gordon knows where this is going to go but what you're going to see here is that one of the players that's pushed inside is going to make a nice spin move and face Gordon head on at the line of scrimmage and Gordon then executes a nice stiff arm to be able to get away here and then you're going to see the reversal of field. See the spin move off of here? We're going to watch it one more time. He's going to make contact, spin off, and engage Gordon. But Gordon sees it quick enough to get the stiff arm out. And again, this isn't an evidence of great power because neither Gordon nor the defensive, the defensive lineman are in great position when they're hitting. See how off balance he is to hit? Gordon is only, Gordon. All he has to do is flick that stiff arm out there to really to really knock this guy back onto his heels because he's already on his heels in the first place. So if you say he's got great power based on this, then you're not really watching the angles of where the defender is hitting. But it again, it's a quick reaction. And then the feet. This is what Bloom brought out brought up that I thought was just a terrific piece of analysis because. You know, a lot of what Gordon does is what looks like stop-start movement, um, but his feet never really stop moving. And what I pointed out is it's a lot like a ladder drill. When you watch the ladder drills of agility drills with running backs, where they're moving their feet through the ladder and it's short, choppy steps, and they're going either inside the between the rungs of the ladder and going laterally, and you see them doing these types of moves. Watch how Gordon on this play never stops his feet, makes short steps, and he's kind of chopping through the ladder here. Right here, yep, right there. That right there, the, the last couple of moves, here as he goes in and out, that's like going in and out of the ladder. He stops his feet once here, but to really kind of get through the traffic like he did, 
again, looks a lot like a ladder drill. And that's a good emphasis of showing that he has terrific feet. He never comes to a full stop. He's able to continue moving and maintain that momentum enough to change direction at a quick enough pace to avoid all of these defenders. That's going to be a promising aspect of Gordon's game in the NFL. If he can show a consistent ability to get through tight creases by identifying them and exploiting them with that type of footwork and burst, then that's why he's going to be an NFL starter. If he's unable to do that at the NFL level, then he may disappoint and be a change of pace guy with really nice athleticism, but you know, maybe a little bit overrated in terms of his draft prospects. That's the that's the argument for or against him, depending on what he's able to do um, vision-wise. And I think as we see this game um, play out, that you're going to see evidence of that vision that is going to make it work for him in the NFL. And this is that play. And we're going to watch this again. You know, he breaks his play for a nice long run. He's finally run down by the cornerback here. And Bloom brings up that... You know, we're going to see this in a minute again, that the cornerback who catches him probably means that Gordon has four, four, like 4.45 four, four, speed, somewhere between 4.45 four, four, and 4.5 four, speed, and not 4.3 speed that, you know, that people would look at and say, wow, you know, he's got that. He can break one for a long run at any time. This one's more of that he's going to get long runs, but he's not going to have breakaway 80-yard gains at any moment if, you know, if somebody takes a wrong angle. But watch this play because what you're going to see here is Gordon get through a very small NFL size crease. And it's a display of his vision at the second level, his ability to see what's going on at the third level with the safety, as well as his confidence in being able to squeeze through um, a tight crease that he sees opening here. So these, these linemen are going to slant to the left. The, as they slant, Gordon is going to identify the hole right here. As he slant, as these guys slant, you're going to see the center who's on the ground, and you're going to see the, the, the guard and tackle slanting to this side, and you're going to see this backside guard moving over to create this crease. But this crease is going to close up. Really what Gordon sees is this guy on the ground and that there's going to be an open space all the way through here as he's reading the safety also mimicking where Gordon's going or shadowing. And so Gordon then is able to pop through here. I'm going to show this again. Watch the center, and he falls to the ground. He's falling to the ground as he's getting through here. But that's going to leave an open space to this backside of the center's body. Gordon's going to read that, and then right here, look how small this crease is, where you know a lot of people might have thought he was heading in this direction you know, towards the left tackle side, like outside the left tackle. Looks like that maybe he's going to head out here. And even the safety is going to read that maybe it looks like it's going to be a bounce. But what he's really looking at is this small crease. And it's really nice flexibility, which Bloom points out, is this really great flexibility right here to make this move and squeeze through here. That's a really beautiful cut. And he's able to get through on this, pop through, and have the confidence to get there and then just get way upfield. And he ends up fooling, you know, basically that cut fools the safety, fools the linebacker, fools these backside guys. And they all are not able to take the right angle. He eludes them, and that's what gets him into this open field. And then you see the, the cornerback be able to run him down. And we'll go back and look at this angle from, from, this, from this point of view here. Where is it? There we go. This is where the cornerback is on the play, where Gordon's going to run through here and cut up. Following the cornerback with my cursor here, he sees him, and you see him run him down. So, again, LSU has some really good NFL-caliber athletes, maybe not NFL-caliber players all the time on defense, but certainly from top to bottom they have guys with – often enough with the speed to get a look from the NFL. And this cornerback here certainly shows that running down Gordon in the open field. Gordon knows he's lost that angle. That's why he protects the ball and then tries a stiff arm at the end. Not much there. I mean, you can look at this and say, look, he stopped his feet in the hole. 
but this is because he sees number 95 cutting across. Number 95 right here does an excellent job of sliding inside his blocks. He gets inside with his shoulder, comes over the top, clogs this lane. Gordon sees that, can't really stop in time, then tries to slide away, and he's wrapped for the backside pursuit. Not much that he's going to be able to do there on that play. Again, you know, just kind of pushing forward on that play. Nothing that you're going to say is great power on his part. Now watch that block. We're going to watch this one more time here. We're going to watch Gordon pass protect here off the edge. Again, he leads with his shoulder and his elbow, his forearm. He's not getting in front of the man and using his arms to extend and punch. And this is an indication that it might take him a preseason and part of the, the, his rookie year to really learn these techniques and become a better pass protector before a team trusts him enough to use him every down. Again, it's a chip, so he's getting a chance to punish like this. But you still want to see a guy um, avoid that because a defender is going to be able to take advantage of a guy loading up too much. Again, there's a nice punch. This defender isn't really geared towards watching that, but it's a good punch knocking the guy out. Love the effort, but again, loading up the forearm. Good result, not great technique, but something to be worked with. And then there's Gordon bouncing off a player. This is the one broken tackle, I would say, that wasn't an ankle tackle in this game that he makes. But even so, how effective is this of a function of power? It avoids the loss, which is good. He sheds him, but he's still going to step out of bounds, and it's still going to be for a loss. So, you know, how, how much did he really do anything effective by breaking this tackle. So, I mean, again, functional power, not great power. And this is a good example of Gordon trying to chip and lower his shoulder. And what happens when a defender is savvy to seeing a guy lower the, lower the helmet, lower the shoulder, and not be able to look at a man head up and, and make a block with control. Because he slips through. And yes, he's slipping through. But look, he tries to lower the shoulder. And what the defender does is grab him and just throw him back. Just throw him back like that. In the NFL, that's going to happen more often, and it's going to be a more immediate effort that's going to result in quarterback pressure. So there's Melvin Gordon for us. We're going to take a look after this at um, um, Amari Cooper, but before we do, as I transition over to looking at Cooper's tape, um, and again, thank you to Draft Breakdown. These guys are absolutely terrific, and, you, you know, do fantastic work with these cut-ups and posting them here. So I definitely recommend you going and checking them out if you're into watching film. Um, Gordon, to me, you know, he got a second-round grade. Um, I look at that and say I can see how he might be a second-round pick, but I don't see him as a first-round pick. And, and the reason being is that he doesn't have that functional power. He still has to learn to pass protect a little bit better. A lot of his runs come on jet sweeps. Um, a scout that I spoke with, watched him and when he commented to me when I put out my RSP boiler room post on Gordon he said I noticed too that Gordon didn't have a lot of power and a lot of strength and I was glad that you saw that and he says I saw some numbers that showed that between 35 and 40 percent of his runs um, were jet sweeps as a junior in 2013 which contributed a lot to his 8.1 yards per carry average and he didn't break a lot of tackles and so in the NFL, again, for some teams, this will be fine because depending on the depth chart, they may have a more powerful runner. Depending on the scheme, they may run more draw plays, more jet sweeps, more outside design runs, more looks where they can get him into open space or that he's following guys in a way that he's not going to have to really create a lot of space on his own. 
then also he may improve enough where he gets a little bit more strength and he becomes that kind of player where that he can you, you know run through some of the wraps that you didn't see here him run through against LSU um, at the same time the footwork is really good the ability to find those small creases that's fantastic that one crease where he runs gets a big gain Ben Jarvis Green Ellis an undrafted back would would be able to make that type of a play he may not have been able to run the extra 25 30 yards that Gordon does but he would find that crease and get through it and that's why there's not really much of a difference between an undrafted free agent and a first or second round pick when it comes to when it comes to vision it's really the the speed and being able to turn a smaller gain into a bigger play that gives you you know gives you that higher draft status but the quickness the footwork the vision that's why guys who people say have little acclaim end up making in the NFL and oftentimes exceed the production of a first or second round pick who might have the physical skills but doesn't have the vision and the decision making. But it looks like Gordon flashes enough of that that I, I feel pretty confident that he may not be a complete back, but he can still be a good starter in the league depending on where he goes. So let's get to Amari Cooper here, the wide receiver from Alabama. I compared him along a spectrum of really Michael Crabtree, Roddy White, and a little bit of Amani Toomer. Um, we're going to watch him in this opener against um, West Virginia, and then maybe we'll watch a little bit of him in a game um, where some highlights from him as a freshman. So let's go ahead and widen this a little bit. You know, he, Cooper's on that right side taking that play. We'll watch it one more time here. And he gets a lot of these kind of quick throws where he can use his his strength and his quickness to get yards after the catch. And it does remind me of Crabtree in this sense because he's got just enough strength and movement to make the first man miss, um, get past the second level, and to be able to threaten the third level with some of his moves and strength to break a tackle. Now you're going to see him down below here quick pass to face up the man and you know this isn't a it's not great movement but you see a little bit of shake and short area quickness with him as Bloom says he brings more to the table than what say Jordan Matthews does with just straight line you know running after the catch that was a play you should have caught and you're gonna see this crossing route coming across behind the official and it's gonna be a low and away throw that bounces off, you know, closer to his knee. It's a tough catch to make when you have to reach behind you and, and catch low like that. But it's a catch that even like a tight end like Jason Witten makes on a routine basis. He made one this weekend um, when they played San Francisco in tight coverage. So it's something that you expect to see, um, but it's not something that you're going to uh, necessarily penalize a guy for dramatically for missing it. Um, in every instance when the quarterback should have made a better throw. Now this is going to be a fun play to go for here. This is a dig route inside, makes the catch, gets the first down. Now we spent a lot of time talking about this play because you know people talk about press coverage all the time, that the player has to learn to defeat the jam, but we don't see a lot of details with how to do that. And I'm going to profile this from a different angle um, after we watch this play one more time and show you exactly how Cooper defeats the jam. But what you're going to see is, you know, it's a nice quick move inside the corner. He gets good depth so that he's able to make the catch at the first down marker. And he gets forward progress after, the, after he's hit. Now we're going to watch this play from this angle and we're going to do it in half speed so that you can see the technique. Now what he's going to do is essentially a three-step release move with his feet and then you're going to see him use his inside arm to kind of block the punch that's delivered to his chest by the corner with his inside arm and then come over the top and chop with his outside arm. The chop is kind of an over-the-top technique to swat down on the arm after he's braced it with the inside arm here. Um, the first thing that you always want to see with the receiver though when they do these types of techniques is to get vertical early on the route, meaning that to run up field and threaten the defender 
with the potential of running a vertical route and going fast as if he's going to go deep, which is going to make this defender turn and open his hips. And once you get the defender's hips opened, as Bloom would say, then you're going to see the move that I am explaining here to get inside and, and get open and get the separation. What you notice here is that this corner is over the top at the line of scrimmage with his feet slightly inside, so he's shaded inside, which means that the tumors, I mean, Cooper here is going to have to do a really good job of getting a good release, release technique to open this man's hips, and you're going to see that here with this, you know, in halftime. You got that three-step release. Now, he doesn't get fully upfield as I would like to see, but it's enough on this play to turn this defender's hips outside, and then he blocks the hit with his arm, hitting the forearm, and then you're going to see this outside arm come over the top and swat away there. It's not perfect release technique. And against a top press corner, he's probably not going to get away with this because he doesn't sell the vertical route enough. And you're going to see, you know, it's small steps here when he does so. Short steps, and this guy still reacts. He'd have to take probably a larger step against a better cornerback to sell this, but it's still good enough here, and it's the makings of a good release technique. And he drives upfield, turns fast, gets his head around fast, makes the catch low and away and behind his hip. All really good things. These are things you can work with with an, with an NFL prospect, and he's going to get better because he shows the adjustment to make the play on a tough target. He shows the depth that he needs to get, and he's working on these release techniques and showing that he can do it on the field. All good work. So let's go ahead, watch it in real time. We're going to watch real time the next place here. What you're going to see here, I think, is some blocking. No, this is this is a zone route. Just finds the open area. That's good. You know, pretty basic thing. But what I like is he's always willing to, to face up the quarterback, willing to take the hit if need be. Once he makes a catch, though, he's looking for the defender and figuring out where he needs to go, and he makes that first defender miss. This, perhaps, is going to be the weakest part of um, Amari Cooper's game, which is blocking. He shows the effort, just like Melvin Gordon um, he wants to hit, he wants to establish contact, but he's always trying to knock the guy out. It's either knocked out, knock out the guy or be knocked out or whiff. And in this case, he comes in, he loads up, and you see him lower his head. You don't want to lower your head to block a guy unless you're going to cut block and go across, and even then you want your head up. So, you, you know, he's lowering. You, the only time you want to lower your shoulders and your body is a cut block, but even then you want to cut with your head up to see where you're going. In this case, he's loading up and giving the shoulder to the guy. Now, he makes a nice hit, but the guy bounces off immediately because he has no control with his hands to attack the, the defensive back. And that allows the defensive back just to come in, swoop in, clean up the play, and get the angle. Not a good block, just good effort in terms of being physical. You're going to see this a lot with his blocking. On this play, he just misdiagnoses the block. What happens is that, again, he, wants, he sees the angle, he stops to load up, and at this point, there's too much space between he, Cooper and the defender. And the defender is able to, uh, here he comes into the play, Defender is able to slide outside and clean up this play, and Cooper's left in the dust. You're going to see this a few more times on this in this game. Here's Cooper on the outside. Turn, faces up a man. You know, easy little stop up. Now, this is a good example of his balance and strength here as a runner after the catch. Now, we're going to watch this again in a couple of different angles, I believe. You know, he's he's got good speed off the line to get through, makes the catch close to his body, runs through the little ankle-biting tackle, and then tries to spin off the man in the left flat. He's a tough out as a runner, and that's a good thing.
once again, he's prepared for contact here on this play. Not bad. You know, he's facing off coverage, makes a nice catch with his hands, turns upfield, good ball protection. Nice fundamentals. Completely misses this screen play in terms of a block. You're going to watch him come down here and miss the angle. There's the defensive back making the play. And they're going to show it again. Stops too early. This way, he comes right in. He's not anticipating where he needs to go in a proper way. And this type of diagnostic deficiency with him as a blocker might be something he never really um, gets better at. Because I find it's hard for guys who don't see the field and the outcome of uh, the angles of wh where a guy's running. If they're not seeing it right now in the college game, it, I think it's kind of difficult to adjust to in the pro game. We'll see. It might get better. The effort at least is there. He does want to hit and block. There, really nothing there. Misses that angle too. Just gets a, a glancing blow on the player. Overruns a lot of plays or sets up too early. It's a nice little slant. Takes the hit. You know, that's what you want to see from him. This is more Crabtree-like when you watch him. You know, has that first move, willing to get physical, able to make plays on the ball with his hands. All things you like to see. If he can, if he can get a little, if he can show a little bit more quickness than Crabtree has, a little bit more deep speed, and maybe more precision with routes, he might be on that trajectory of Roddy White, who is more of that all-around receiver who can do really great work on the perimeter. Now, this play really shouldn't have been an interference penalty, um, and I'll show you why on the second um, view of this tape. Here it comes. Really, it's, it's more because you're going to see an arm bar on this play, and we're going to look at the route in a minute. But you're going to see an arm bar coming from the safety across the field, coming right here. But the ball's underthrown. He had no way to catch this ball because... Cooper just doesn't take the right angle. There's the arm bar across the body. Clear interference if it was a catchable ball. But I would argue that he so mistracked this ball that it wasn't catchable because here's where the ball's coming down. Here's where Cooper is. And the arm's preventing Cooper from going forward, not backward. So to me, it's an inaccurate interference penalty. But Cooper, on the other hand, doesn't track this ball well. But let's look at this play again because really I think most wide receivers, even the NFL, I would say 70 to 80% of the wide receivers in the NFL wouldn't track this ball well either, and I'm going to show you why. First off, the line of scrimmage. Let's watch this route. Good vertical sell. That's what you always want to see in the beginning. And a good vertical sell is seen when you see the shoulders over the knees. That's a guy driving upfield, and he's getting straight upfield. It's going to force a defender to be influenced to turn his hips and, and run rather than just play the quarterback. And he does have to turn and run even though he's looking at the quarterback. Cooper baits the, the defender by turning his head inside and then veering inside enough that it makes the corner have to bite inside. And then when he makes the break outside, the corner slips and it's all over. He's wide open here on this break. This is a nice setup by Cooper on a vertical play. Now, Watch the fact that after this, after this break, he's looking back to the ball immediately. But then the safety's coming across, and he's going to turn and look at the safety because he, see, he sees the flash of the safety here. He looks back on the ball again and, and continues to track it. But once the safety gets closer, Cooper's worried about getting hit. And as a result, he loses track of the ball because that second look, he loses track and doesn't really is not able to gauge where the ball's really coming, and that's where the corner comes in. The corner is going to gauge it, and he's completely lost track of it. Most players are going to lose track of it if they see a safety screaming across like this. The, the, an example of an exception might be Randy Moss. Randy Moss was great at tracking a football, and I think that he would have been able to bait this safety, stay, stay, you know, aware of where the ball trajectory is going to go and be able to um, avoid the safety altogether and make a play on the ball and come back to it rather than have continued running downfield and lost track. Because you saw him look down here. Right here is where you see 
Cooper looked down right there. He looks down. Now he's lost track of where the ball is going to be, and he ends up continuing forward rather than ducking backwards to and inside for the ball. You know, maybe 12 receivers in the league in any given year are good enough to be able to track the ball like this. And those are your wide receiver fantasy ones if you're a fantasy owner. Watch this hit. Nails the linebacker here. This is a play that in the NFL <laughs> might be a penalty. You're going to see it one more time from this angle and then from a second angle. Lowers the shoulder, boom. Again, love the effort, love the physicality, both as a runner and a blocker. Here it comes. But it also might be termed a penalty. But he got in front of the guy. But again, you know how sensitive the NFL is getting these days. So, And in some cases, rightfully so, even though I know some old school folks like me and other viewers don't like it. Bloom wanted me, asked me on this play whether or not I liked the fact or cared about the fact that Cooper kind of showed his displeasure with body language after this catch or after this play. And you'll see it one more time here. We're going to see it's a corner sale route that the, the wide receiver misses or that the quarterback misses here. And Cooper's bouncing up and down and looking at the quarterback or just kind of like, God, it should have been there. I don't really care about this kind of stuff. I mean, there, there can be egregious instances of this, but if a quarterback can't handle the fact that he made a bad play and his receiver's mad about it because he's passionate enough about the game to want to um, to make to take advantage of being open, then you shouldn't be a quarterback and you shouldn't be a leader. You're not going to be a leader and you're not going to be a quarterback in the NFL. So here it is again. You know, and he makes a nice little, he's used a little stutter step at the top of his break, a little hesitation that causes the safety to bite here. Not a bad play. Pretty good route. Now here's Cooper working back to the quarterback and getting low. And we're going to see this from another angle. This is a nice play. Inside position by the corner who's going to, who's going to blitz. You see the safety playing inside. Nice little break inside here and he does get under the safety and open but then he sees the quarterback and as Bloom points out it's a very underrated facet for um, NFL prospects at receiver we talk a lot about quarterbacks he says you know being able to improvise outside the constraints of a play and it's the same thing it's very important for receivers to do the same thing and this is where they often need to adjust for NFL um, the rigors of the NFL is to be able to make these adjustments Here's a play where he doesn't get as many yards as you would like to see, but you like the effort, you like the quickness, he just falls down. But watch him set up the defender with the first move to the inside, or to the outside here. Gets the defender's hips open outside, and then tries to make the hard cut and set inside, but he slips. Still falls forward to get six, not a bad game gain here, but you know he's always trying to get that extra thing where maybe sometimes he doesn't need to. It's, again, high effort guy. You admire that, but it's not always going to work out. This is another example of that. Better technique. Maybe he's able to shield and control the man, but here he comes inside the block, and he lowers the boom, and he falls down. Hit, knock out or be knocked out. That's his motto, or at least the theme. And we talked about this, too. You know, Sometimes when you're watching tape, it's about looking for th overriding themes that are occurring within the game. You know, watching tape is sometimes watch an, like analyzing a book at a book club or in a literature class. You know, there's two ways to look at players and evaluate or many layers. One of those layers can be the data layer and the data analysis, and that's certainly a good way to look. And you can find a lot of layers that will help you when you're looking at your you know, you're looking at the film. The same thing is when, you know, the film can also be an added layer for the data analysis. And in this case, you know, um, you might be able to count up certain things like number of blocks that he didn't, percentage of blocks that he doesn't, you know, doesn't use well, but then you also, or execute well. Um, but then you can also look at the fact that um, the technique of what he's doing, but also the attitude. You know, what is the feeling you get of this player? What is the attitude that you get? And you see that he has an aggressive physical attitude. That's something that you're not going to be able to quantify.
but you are going to be able to you are going to be able to notice on the tape. Again, not bad, you know, kind of an aggressive play. He wasn't in great position. The throw, you know, wasn't great here. But you see him frame separation a little bit with his hands and then reach for it and try and snatch. And he, get, oh, he gets his hands on it, but not quite there. Here's a slant play, I believe. No, this is, this is another one. This is where, this is a good example of sometimes you, people can discount a play and not analyze it where you have a perfect opportunity to analyze a play if you have a little bit of imagination and you project what you're going to see in the NFL. This is a play where the wing back goes up the seam and this cornerback covering Cooper is going to peel off because he's playing the quarterback's eyes, reads his eyes, comes over the top and makes the interception. Now what this has to do with analyzing Cooper you're going to see in a minute. And it's going to be about this route, and I'm going to show that to you in a minute. But he comes over the top, makes the play. Nice effort here. But still, when you're watching it close up like this, you can still analyze Cooper's route. Because if you're going to project this to the NFL game, a cornerback watching Cooper running this type of route, Cooper isn't paying attention to the cornerback reading the quarterback here. He's just paying attention to how he's running his route, which is basically you know, a stop route or a little hook route here up this flat. He comes off with a vertical release. This is going to drive the man back and run. Now, while the man is looking at the quarterback, in this particular instance, a better NFL cornerback, and you want to project for the NFL game, better NFL cornerback is going to face Cooper and probably not play the eyes of the quarterback. So he's going to have less of a, he's going to give less distance to Cooper here. And he's going to, have to he's going to wait for Cooper to try and really sell that vertical route and if he doesn't Cooper's going to have to do a better job of making one step here with this break dropping his hips like he did but one step in turning and being more sudden because an NFL corner playing over the top with his chest facing Cooper is going to be able to break on this ball faster um, if the throw was coming to Cooper in the first place Again, none of these things are literally happening. So if you have too literal of a mindset, you're going, well, yeah, he's playing the quarterback. That doesn't matter. We didn't see that. We had no evidence of this. But then you're not really looking. You're not projecting. You're just looking at the reality of the situation. And scouting is projection. That's a lot of what this is about. And this is why sometimes it can go wrong. Sometimes you can miss things on players, but you want to look for evidence of situations. So again, let's watch this play one more time and see Cooper in a situation where you're imagining the corner playing Cooper and not the ball. Cooper's still kind of, you know, he's not driving as much as you would expect. A better corner might be a little tighter and not buying the vertical release. And too many steps here. You could see that you can imagine the corner at this point stopping and breaking forward on a throw. So as you can see, even with Cooper's body language here, Cooper is breaking like he's expecting to get the ball. And then he stops and goes, oh, yeah, turns the head. Oh, it's going over here. He wasn't even paying attention to the corner. That's why you can project this play as and analyze this route within the context of what it might look like in the NFL. And what it looks like is he has to get better at dropping his hips and being more sudden with his breaks on, on harder breaking routes on the perimeter. And that's why that maybe compares more to, to Crabtree in terms of function in the middle of the field, even though Crabtree is a much smoother route runner. But in order for him to really become that dynamic number one receiver or a really reliable wide receiver too in, in, a, in a, a starting lineup, he's going to have to refine his routes. Now, here's a nice play. See him upfield, nice little stop, little stiff arm, spins off, almost spins off the second guy. Tough out. That's what you like about a receiver in the open field. He's not, he's not fantastic at it, but again, he's going to force a guy to give his A game when it comes to tackling. This one's a block in the back. It's going to get called back. 
and Cooper, when he has to be dainty about it and use technique, he's not good at it. It's just, you know, the diagnosis isn't there. Understanding where he should be at when it comes to setting up angles. He didn't set up this angle on the defender at all. And that's why he ended up pushing the guy in the back. Because right here, he's going too far forward. He should be angling inside. And he kind of lets up when he angles inside. Should have angled inside and been more intense to force this guy inside, then turn back on the man so that he could have sealed it inside a little bit more. Instead, he's pushing the player in the back all the way, and this run's called back, and Yeldon's run's all for naught. You're going to see it on the close-up here, I think, one more time before this ends. Yep, here it comes. He's just out of his element when it comes to making blocks where he doesn't have to hit hard. Let's watch one more set of Cooper here. And this is some freshman highlights of him going downfield because there's some good things to highlight here. You know, this is some plays after covered. You know, this is some more deeper plays that we didn't see earlier. Nice little use of his hands. Watch how he swat the back of the elbow of the, the defender. Now, the coverage isn't great. A lot of mistakes by 27. But the fact that he's a freshman and is able to, to use, show using his hands, then get vertical, use his hands there to frame separation a little bit more. It's not interference. He's just establishing his space, not really pushing off. It's just He swatted away the defender there more than pushed off and then makes the basket catch with his hands after contact. This is all nice work. It's not refined work. But it's it's technique that you can work with. And again, that overriding theme that he's capable of being physical. And that's what you want to see with an NFL player is physical play. You know, good burst, runs through a wrap. Nice work. You're going to see a lot of this from him in the NFL probably too. Now, this is one of my favorite deep plays that we were going to see. Nice, you know, Bloom pointed out here with Cooper, the timing of his leaps is really is really what's worthwhile here. Nice timing to leap for it. But what I love, look at the fingers, the way he catches the ball with his fingers, not his palms. When you see wide receivers drop passes when they extend their arms to the ball, oftentimes it's because they let the ball hit their palms first, and it just, it, 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 bounces off their palms kind of the way a drumstick would hit a snare drum. That recoil can be too much to handle sometimes, but with the fingers, you get to handle the ball and control it a little bit better, even after contact. And that's what he's able to do. You're going to see this a little bit more closer. See how see it's all the fingers here on the ball that he's able to make this catch with. And then he's able to control it and bring it down with his fingers and then adjust and tuck it under. Good work there. You know, again, this is not great coverage. Decent speed, but nothing great. Decent power, but bad tackling. You know, you've got to bring it with Cooper. That's not, you know, it's not great play by the defense there, but it was still, you know, good play by Cooper. Busted coverage. You're not going to look at Cooper here and say, oh, he's got great speed. But it's easy to think he does when you watch these types of plays where they're, the ball's thrown far downfield and then he's waiting on it like that. You know, that's more just him being wide open. Lots of play action, too. That's another thing that you need to notice is that when Cooper does get wide open on a guy who's covering you know, in single coverage, that it's often play action predicating the play. And we're going to sh show this one more time here. And you're going to see this more often in this play action pass. Guy was looking at, was kind of playing back and watching the quarterback and didn't turn to run soon enough. Another play action pass. Wasn't a deep play, but nice power at the end. But this was the corner. You know, you had the defensive back playing off on this, you had the up defender who was reading, this guy was actually reading the play action. So, you know, 
this was a wide open playing zone. This man here is, was looking at the at the play action. You'll watch it. Stays watching, watching. Then he starts to break, breaking late. By this time, Cooper's already open underneath. You know, but if he didn't, if he wasn't reading the play action and didn't have to account for it, he probably would have dropped back for deeper earlier on the play, and this might not have happened. This might not have been a touchdown. So again, good play by Cooper, but nothing that's special about what he does that would separate him from anybody else. You know, no touchdown here. Doesn't even get a foot in bounds as he catches the ball. But again, kind of thrown wide. Would have been a difficult play for him to make here. But here's the thing about extending for the ball. Watch that he doesn't get his fingers on this ball. It's more with his hand. Oops. It's more with his with his hands here. But he still makes the play to be able to catch it. You get second chances when you extend for the ball, even if it's not perfect technique. Now this is a nice play. As Bloom would point out, he has no compunction about, you know, he has no issue about attacking the ball regardless of a defender being there. Comes back, comes over the top. Again, good use of his arms to extend and snatch the ball. That's the thing I like. Is that once he makes the catch, watch him retract it fast. Quick retraction. Doesn't worry about the defender coming across for contact. Great play. Here's another fantastic catch with his fingers. And also excellent timing and reach, as Bloom has pointed out repeatedly when we watch this game. Timing of the jump, that's important. Longer than average wingspan for his height. That's the reason why the Seahawks, in their use of analytics, liked Paul Richardson. I, you know i got to get Paul Richardson in here somewhere, fantasy fans. There you go. So that's a nice reach for the ball. Watch him. And it's a good coverage here by the Georgia defender. His hands are a little higher because he leaped first. Watch him catch with the fingers and control the ball. All fingers, no palms. That's why he wins this. We're going to see one more angle. Look at that. Fingers to pull the ball away. Strong fingers, strong hands. little bobble there, but again, it's because he had a contested play to make. Strong hands. Good play. That's going to work well in the NFL. This is a fun play, I think, because, you know, when you watch A.J. McCarron on a lot of these throws, these are um, oftentimes the throws are have been short, and he's had to slow down and wait for the ball. And this is a great play in the sense that it shows that um, Cooper's so used to being underthrown on deep routes that he actually stops around, I believe, the third, somewhere between the 35 and 25. He slows down, expecting the ball to be, you know, the trajectory to be slow and and to be short. And then he realizes that McCarron actually puts enough mustard on this ball um, that he has to continue running. Like right here, oh, oh, okay, I got to run faster. About the 20. That's that to me is kind of funny after watching McCarron so much. It's like, oh, I'm slowing down, slowing down. Oh, 20, I got to go faster. That shows you how much a receiver is used to his quarterback not being able to throw the ball downfield with velocity on a consistent basis. And as Drew Bloom would say, adrenaline, adrenaline. So that was that was what we watched. I wish that I could have. Uh, showing you the recording of the broadcast with Bloom and I, but hopefully you get a gist of what I'm going to be doing here on Fridays. I'll feature Cecil Lammy. I'll feature other guys, maybe Kian Fayo, come on the show. We'll see if I can get Josh Norris to come on with me. Um, variety of guys like that. Maybe Dane Brugler will join me and watch some guys and, and do this type of work for an hour each week. Thanks again for watching. And, uh, you know, in terms of Cooper, let me just say that I think that he's a decent player, has some potential to be along the spectrum of Crabtree or Roddy White. If it's White, it'll be because he has more speed than what I've seen so far. And if it's um, with Cooper, if it's with um, Crabtree, um, I think that what you're going to see is just a little bit more refinement with his blocking and his ability to make people miss in the open field. 
both Cooper and Gordon are really nice players. I think that they're going to be starters in the NFL one day if they can continue to, to refine their games. Um, but neither to me are locks as first round picks. And they're guys that will probably be either in committee situations and Cooper in, in um, Gordon's case, um, or maybe a lead back in a specific type of offense, and he could be a very good lead back in a specific offense. But we're going to have to see, you know, where he fits in. And with Cooper, it's going to be more of can he be that, you know, lead slot receiver, the big slot receiver, kind of like Marcus Colston or Michael Crabtree or Jordan Matthews if Jordan Matthews works out. But he's got a little bit more movement than Matthews and Colston. He's more along the lines of Crabtree there. So thanks again for listening. If you like this, give me some feedback. Let me know. Um, you know I'm going to continue to refine this as we go. And eventually, you're going to see the RSP film room where I might actually have some guests come over here to my office and watch some football together and do a little bit more production than just Google Hangouts. Thanks again.